ready to go. Three, two, one. Okay, so I'm Anthony Swagger Branch, and this is my senior defense. You know, most people give a title to their senior defense. This isn't really my style, but uh, before we start, you know, I'd like to thank everybody at Dozier. You know, the teachers and the staffs are great. I'm glad to be in front of a panel with some of my favorite teachers in it, and uh, I want to give a thanks to James Morris for giving me this water and the thumbnail that this is on, and I want to thank Carl's Jr. for being a proud sponsor of my senior defense, because, I mean, Without them, we wouldn't have this. So, uh, you know, as you most of you guys know, I started off the first two years at Deer Valley. I'm the only junior to ever been accepted into Dozier. So, uh, there's my best friend, Zach Zeal. There he is again. And there's son, uh, son, another one of my good friends. I've been friends with him since like second grade or something. Friends with Nick Bunting too, but in the middle, we kind of had a split over a game of Wii Sports. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, there, there's me with uh, my good friend Caleb. Uh, yeah, we kind of had a little scuffle right before that, but you know we were friends. And then this is what I used to look like at Deer Valley, so I kind of changed a lot over time, as uh, Mrs. Zeal said, from a hippie to a fundamentalist, independent fundamental Baptist. That is. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, here. Uh, when I got to Dozier, you know, I fit in pretty well. At first, I didn't really have that many friends besides, like, Andreas, who isn't here because he's getting his defense because I knew him from uh, middle school. But it wasn't my first time being the new kid out of school because in middle school, I had to leave uh, Cornerstone ha Christian School halfway through because of some unfortunate events. And then I <laughs> <laughs> So uh, when I got here, you know, I so well liked some people have described me as the most popular girl in the school. <laughs> and anyway, there's my friend James, James Morris. Uh, there's Constantine up on that rock. You can't see him really, but uh, <laughs> he's down there too. And then here's me. So uh, Johan and Gideon aren't on this slide, but there's no reason to have Gideon on the slide because everybody knows we're good friends. And, uh, don't want to tone down my relationship with Johan, though. Me and him are great friends. You know, a couple weeks ago, we had a little bit too much fun in advisory. We ended up hanging out for, like, hours together in Mr. Burgerhouse's office. <laughs> uh, I do martial arts outside of school, Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu. Jiu Jitsu is not on here because it's, like, hard to take pictures when you're rolling around on the ground and stuff. But, uh,. Yeah, I'm better at Muay Thai, so there's me after my first competitive fight, and then uh, here I am sparring with some guy at a gym in Richmond, there's me at a seminar in Oakland, and there's me at my gym training, and there's my coach right there, and that guy, those other two guys are actually professional fighters, which is kind of under, Muay Thai is underground here in uh, America, so it's not really a big deal, but in Thailand, it's a huge deal and part of their culture, so they're probably a pretty big deal in Thailand. And me, there I am there, and there's my coach, and everybody else is also a professional Muay Thai fighter from Thailand in that picture who I met at a seminar. So for college, I'm going to Montana State University. You know, everybody tells me that this is a great college, except for Johan, of course. But uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, I have a lot of stuff on here. So the ancient Greeks, they emphasized athletics just as much as academics, so they wanted to balance it out. So, you know, that's why I have some school stuff on there, but also have my athletic goals and then my outdoor stuff. Uh, that, that's a picture of the college. These are pictures I actually took from my vacations in Montana. There's me uh, climbing a giant, or on top of a giant rock I climbed. We'll get more of that later, but you know, I might get into rock climbing in college because it's there and it seems interesting to me. And I'm majoring in chemistry, so uh, after that I plan on going to law school, though, to either be a lawyer or hopefully president. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I used to be a vegan for like a year and a half, but I thought that wasn't really healthy for me, although it was good for animals and stuff. So uh, now I'm on the paleo diet, and I hope to stay on that in college. By the time I graduate college, I want to be a 240-pound bodybuilder. So like Johan, you know, I want to turn myself into Iron Man. That's actually not a joke. Uh, and I want to drive the Ford F-350 down there. That's a Chevy, but, you know, close enough. So I'm saying career goals, as I said, I want to be a, a leader, like a politician or lawyer. I actually did an internship at the district attorney's right there. That's a picture of me there. and I. Uh, did a lot there. I I got a 
meet people, you know, meet the attorneys, get good connections, great job references, and I got to listen to a lot of court cases. This defense attorney named Tony Sarah, I don't know if you guys know him, but he's supposed to be like the best defense attorney in the Bay Area. I got to see him in court speaking, and it was uh, this case where the this Chinese, uh, Chinese guy, like immigrant, he killed his pregnant girlfriend and left her in the desert in Nevada. And it was obvious that this guy was guilty, but you know, this lawyer was so great that he had me thinking the guy was innocent. So uh, yeah, and here's my thesis. Uh, being the only student to have arrived at Dozier Libby as a junior, I was dropped into a new and unfamiliar environment. However, I quickly adapted socially and academically as I developed mentally, physically, and spiritually into a great leader with unimaginable problem solving and critical thinking capabilities and overwhelming speaking and writing expertise. So I don't have growth artifacts obviously because I went to Deer Valley in my first two years so I kind of just summed up what I did at Deer Valley to uh, introduce each vital topic. And uh, so at Deer Valley we never had group projects and I don't really have any of my work from that time because I wasn't planning on doing this. So yeah, and before Dozier Libby, I was always interested in chemistry and not political leadership. But you know, I started reading the news a lot more kind of in between my transition from Deer Valley to here and I got more into like politics because I was like, somebody needs to do something to uh, make America great again. You know? <laughs> so, and I was like, nobody else is doing it. So I guess I'll dedicate my life to doing that. And then uh, at Deer Valley, I was actually kind of shy. I mean, I had a good amount of friends and everything, but uh, I never really had the chance to be a leader, no group projects or anything, you know? And it used to kind of scare me to speak in front of a classroom freshman and sophomore year, but now I actually love it. So uh, yeah, and this isn't really a defensible artifact, but this is, uh, this isn't my senior defense thesis statement, but this is a project I did last year in Mrs. Ross's class, and I just put it on here because it exemplified my first time actually being a leader. You see, squad, my squad, was like six people in that class, and I actually met them by being put in that class when I got to Dozier, but Mrs. Ross said we could only have like four or five people in a group, so we decided to split it. She let us split it into three, two groups of three. So I had to lead my group of Gideon and James Morris, and I had to step up. I wanted to get the civil rights era because I thought it would be the best to do. So in order to get that, I needed to win like uh, six to 10 games of rock, paper, scissors. And <laughs> I, I did that, and then we got the era, and I made the PowerPoint, wrote the script, kind of directed everything. So it was good to be able to do something meaningful as a leader for once. And then here's Project Eddie. So my group wasn't really like, we were really confused about this task. It seemed overwhelming to have to build something like this, you know, just really real world situation. So uh, <coughs> I kind of stepped up as a leader and used my house where we could do work. And, uh, you know, I was good, great at physics. So I helped with that and I, yeah, we all had to answer the essential questions together and everything for medical ethics. But anyways, Justice was in my group and he decided to come up with like a duster you could use without hands. So our first photo prototype, which I don't have a picture of, but I have the drawing that I made to scale mathematically right there. Uh, it just had a soda bottle as a socket for the stump of the arm, but that, that wasn't enough to hold the weight of the duster. So. You know, with my uh, love of martial arts and everything, I decided we could use a boxing glove and just kind of velcro it shut. And then you could put the stump of your arm in that and put it on and then you could use that to dust things. So I used the idea of a third class lever in which uh, the effort is like between the fulcrum and the, the load, which would, the load would be the duster, fulcrum would be the elbow and the effort's coming from the bicep and tricep muscles. So I use a third class lever to make that. And then I also had to keep in mind like throughout the entire project, politically correct language for persons with disabilities and respectful language and that we should rather change society to accommodate those people and, instead of like them changing to accommodate the majority. And uh, this all ties into again, my internship where you know, I gotta apply stuff to the real world and see what it's really like in court and learn about law and laws relating to disabled people. 
and that, that's how I wanted to use these skills to work towards something in the future of actually doing something in the real world instead of just at school. And uh, yeah, so basically that's where we got to learn about laws relating to persons with disabilities in the modern day and the problems that they encounter with the disability rights movement and I realized I could use that and other uh, medical issues for my future and being a political leader. And then, uh, so, on to abstract and critical cognition. At Deer Valley, I never really need to think very, very deeply, except sometimes in AP chemistry class and AP world history, I'd need to think deep about like molecules or uh, like how, how stuff from history influenced the modern day. And for the most part, all I did was learn information and regurgitating on quizzes. It wasn't like Dojo Libby where we need to apply it. And when coming to Dojo, the critical thinking necessary for uh, integrated projects is completely new for me, but I've always been a deep abstract, abstract thinker since childhood. So uh, yeah, I'm great at math. So you guys are wondering what this is, but last year in pre-calculus class, Mrs. O'Connor gave us a worksheet and it had this thing on here and basically what you had to do is figure out if the one in the middle was so many stacks high, come up with an equation for how many blocks there are total in the figure. So I kinda, I thought about it for a while and I put it on pieces of paper. You know, it's gonna be hard to explain this to you guys without paper, especially if you're not good at math and even if you like, even if it was on paper and you weren't good at math, it'd still be hard to understand. But basically I realized that it would have, you'd have to add like say the number the blocks in the stack was n, the total blocks were x, it would be x equals something plus n because you gotta add the stack in the middle, and then it would be times four because there's four uh, edges coming out of the side, and then it would be like n minus times four uh, parentheses, another parentheses, n minus one, another parentheses plus parentheses, n minus two, and you know, it went on and on, it was irrational, like I had to put a dot, dot, dot at the end, but eventually I like used FOIL and multiplying all the stuff together and everything to rationalize it and the equation is 2n squared minus n. So that's how you figure out, you know, in case you ever have a stack of boxes and you know how many and <laughs> how you figure that out. So uh, I also had to apply math again to Eddie and I had to think deeply like, you know, that the first prototype wasn't working so what could I do? So I really had to think, you know, outside the box, or, uh, well, it was boxing glove, but, you know, <laughs> think outside the box to figure out how to get a socket that worked. And then I used math, again, to scale down and make these, I used uh, one little square equals like a centimeter for, uh, to make these scales of the diagrams for the boxing glove. And, you know, yeah, so that, that's something that I never did at Deer Valley that I had to do here. And then be the change was also deep thinking because, you know, it was just, all I had was a group of two. Most people had a group of five, but it was just me and my best buddy, James Morris. So we had to think of an abstract way of what we could do to help solve the issues of Japan over hunting sea life. So we, we decided to use James's great technology skills to make a YouTube video showing here, and then we had to use my uh, speaking skills to give speeches to uh, students at, around the school and the classrooms who may be concerned about the issue. And then, you know, it, the speeches went well, the video was great, and the speeches were really well received. So we got a lot of uh, support for this issue. We encouraged people to support like Sea Shepherds and nonprofit organizations that were for these whales. and. The only country really doing anything about it is Australia. The US hasn't gotten on this issue very much yet. So, you know, it's good to keep advocating for it. And that's actually a real world, like global problem that we were able to try and do something about. So to sum up this part, you know, the abstract thinking of Montana State University's uh, motto is mountain and mines. So, you know, you have to have a deep thinking mind to go there and both the things on majoring in involve abstract thinking. Chemistry is very abstract. It's uh, 
you know, it's kind of like confusing just how things work on a microscopic level and smaller. And then Albert Einstein said politics is more difficult than physics because it deals with real people, millions of people in the real world. There's no simple like mathematical solution to it. So when I go into law, it will be even harder. And so for writing at Beer Valley, I never really had to write any major essays besides a few times writes in English and AP World of History. I did not save any of these writings, and uh, so but sophomore year at Deer Valley is really when I learned to write, because the AP World History teacher really emphasized writing to, uh, so we could write good essays on that AP test. You know, that's something that he emphasized even more than the English teachers. Mrs. Ross also emphasized that in AP US History. And uh, when I arrived at Dozier, since we wrote so many essays and so many major essays, not just timed rights in class, but take home ones, I was able to uh, really refine my writing skills and practice it. Mrs. Zeal is a great English teacher. Mrs. Poland's good too. And yeah. So when I had to uh, write the Hilo essay to begin with my senior year, I got an 8.8 .8 on it. I was tasked with the question, when human subjects are used to advance medical science, what type of medical uh, or ethical issues can emerge? So, you know, I said that basically throughout history, when we forgot to use medical ethics, it usually led to white male doctors uh, experimenting and doing wrong to marginalized minority groups. And then to back it up, I used Henrietta Lacks, where they cut a piece of her uh, tumor off without asking her and used that to make millions of dollars on their own and they never gave her family any money. And then I also used the Holocaust and um, the Tuskegee Syphilis in Institute study where they injected African Americans with syphilis to, just to see how it worked. And they also left those people to die and they didn't give Henrietta Lacks proper treatment. So, because she was an African American female. And then uh, for my Capital punishment essay in government argued for the death penalty. This is my thesis. In reality, the death penalty has the sure potential to be far more economic than housing convicts in prisons and is sometimes the best way to bring a sense of justice to the victims, friends, and family. It's also important to note that there are some crimes so heinous that the only proper punishment for such an act may be the death penalty. This last sentence here, uh, I actually, when I was doing an internship at the DA's, I got to listen to my head district attorney, the one who's elected, Mark Peterson, give a, give a talk to all the interns. And one thing that he was asked about was the death penalty. And he said that the only reason he supports the death penalty is because he thinks some crimes are so like terrible that there's no other proper punishment than death. So I incorporated that into my essay. And I used a lot of, I used all these arguments to argue for the death penalty. How did today it does cost like more than a, uh, more than life in prison maybe, but that's not really the, it's more about our amb ambiguous thinking on it than the actual death penalty itself because it's like we kind of don't want it, but at the same time we do. So we might try and put somebody on death row, but then there will be so many appeals that will cost a lot of money. So if we just got rid of the frivolous appeals, it would be more economical obviously to put someone to death than like keep them in prison for the rest of their life. And all of this goes back to, you know, in politics, I'll probably support the death penalty, one of my conservative views. Uh, and then also HIPAA, I learned a lot about that in medical ethics and health science three and, uh, and a lot of other medical ethics issues such as with Henrietta Lacks. And, you know, in medical ethics, we learned all year about uh, right to life, right to death type of thing. So we learned everything about just all these issues I didn't know were in the medical field with privacy and all the things that I'll have to deal with if I'm in politics that I never knew about before. So revisiting my thesis, when I arrived at Dozier Libby my junior year, I quickly adjusted my new school and began to develop my writing, speaking, leadership, and complex problem solving skills. I began to work hard to have my options open for choosing a college and work towards my goal of being a future leader. Because when I got here, I didn't really know what college I wanted to go to, so I just kept my grades up so I could go almost wherever I wanted. And, uh, went on a couple vacations to Montana in the summer and decided that's where I wanted to live. So. 
Uh, my conclusion is, upon leaving Dozier Libby, I hope to soon become a rugged mountain man. I've led parts of Montana where I will strive to become a 240 pound bodybuilder who drives a Ford F-350 climbing a giant place and lives in a trailer park despite having a college degree in order to afford large amounts of high quality food. I hope parts of Montana safe to further refine my talents before attending law school. Hopefully when all is done, I will become a political leader or a president. <laughs> two endorsements, uh, Brandon Tan, this kid in my art class named Zaire. And, uh, yeah. So. and everything so I, I didn't always like everything that was happening or the picto charts and Andreas and Gideon wanted to be the leader of the group I said I should have been but you know they were demanding on it so I just kind of let them go ahead and listen to them because they you know I wasn't going to class that much and I, I, I was busy or sick a lot you know so I was just listening I didn't really know that much about IES or what was going on at that time, so I let Gideon lead the group. And were you satisfied with the results? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, <laughs> 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 uh, it, it was pretty good, you know, they just, for, we just kind of forgot to give away foreign aid cash, which was a big part of the assignment, but, uh, you know, I, I also learned for that. Uh, from that to always be more involved in the group. So you think that you have the collaboration skills going forward into your future? Yes, so and when I, I did the Constitution board game with Constantine also at the beginning of the year, Mrs. Larners, he had an idea, and I thought my idea was better, but <coughs> you know, we had to kind of go and meet and draw our stuff out and talk about it for a while. Eventually he came over to my side, but and also, when I was in a group project with Johan, I let Johan lead the group instead of me because, you know, we're, we're both kind of leaders, so we, we, I just didn't want any conflict, like an advisory that day, so I just let him lead the group, you know. Okay. Smart. Hey, two I do. So you touched upon some things that dealt with cultural competency, and you made a argument that you want to go into chemistry and also become a lawyer and you mentioned a lot about ethics now how do you feel going into a scientific field also going into a social sciences field that you can balance the nature of both of having ethics in medicine and having it both in politics well ethics and medicine and politics are completely like intertwined because in medicine Politics regulates medicine to some degree, right? And then also medical advances and the pharmaceutical companies influence political companies. So if you just keep, you know, you just keep the politics more ethical, then the medical companies will have to listen to them and follow along. And uh, yeah, I'm also just, uh, by the way, uh, I'm only getting a degree in chemistry because it's like easy for me and comes naturally. So. I should fly through that and then be able to get a degree in law afterwards. But, so. I do. Can you give me an example of how you use technology to solve an abstract problem? Yeah, with the picto charts and be the change, we use technology to advocate for a health equity issue and the issue with the whales. You know, we used it to put out a message saying. And with the picto charts, we use technology to get simple information under a small, like, just little piece of uh, paper to put on our board. So it was a really 
easy way to use a computer to get out visual images and small amounts of writing. Thank you. Any more questions? No? All right, thank you.